and pop. We believe it's really important to have this uh, yearly opportunity for the community to actually get together in real life, in person. There are some people I literally just like, see maybe like two or three times in a year on these conferences, but it's like always great to just like reconnect. And I think actually I'm just here for the merch. <laughs> in Amber, most of the people I talk to try to converge on one solution essentially and not do five different things. We're building it together. We're the together framework, I guess, if you want to say that. The community is the one that's driving something. It means the community decides what sort of problems are we facing. I mean, those are problems are more or less the same. You end up having solutions that kind of solve problems for everybody else. Yeah, I really, li I really like that, and I really recommend that people watch that documentary because I think it captures a lot of what I really loved about the Ember community. Um, back then, and again, it's like a time warp in between, but I feel exactly the same way as I felt in 2019 about that. Okay. Um, okay. So, so that's basically reconnecting. I think that's what I need to say. I'm a little distracted here, but I will get back on track. So in between um, the time we started, Ember and now I had two kids. During COVID, I had a kid. I think he was going to come back on stage, but I think he is probably uh, six years old and a lot of time went by. So um, he was on stage in 2017 and uh, when he was zero years old. And I think one thing that's really cool about Ember is that Ember is a part of the sustainability story is like we really are, we believe in the, the we believe in not burning people out so they can't have kids. We believe in making Ember sustainable for volunteers, contributors with kids. And I think in general, I really think Julia's talk is going to be awesome. Um, believe it or not, like raising kids has a lot in common with building a web framework the way that we do. And I, and I think Julia's talk unpacks and you should definitely go see it. Um, but in general, really the reason this slide is here is that I've given a few talks since COVID, like a handful, and I keep saying I should really put my kids on the slide because it's a big part of who I am. And I kept forgetting, so there we go. Had kids, that's a big part of who I am. It's a big part of, it continues to be a big part about how I think about Ember and its sustainability, and it's important, I think, to us as a community that it makes sense for kids to be part of it. Um, okay, so, big picture. Um, I think the glue that, 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 is, that I got from Julia's talk, so Ju I did a bunch of run-throughs, Julia showed me her talk ahead of time, and she gave me this concept of architectural building blocks, and again, go see her talk, it's good. And I, it made me think that what's really good about Ember is that we have these building blocks, and I'll unpack this throughout the talk, like components, services, um, routes, that are, as a conceptual matter, they're like these building blocks that, I brought a prop, um, they're like these building blocks that like, you kind of, if you think about what is a service 10 years, like eight years ago or seven years ago, and what is it today? Sure, seven years ago it said ember.object.extend or something like that, and now it doesn't. But how you think about it as a, as a user, as a community member, as a developer, as a beginner, as an expert, all that is basically still the same. And I'm gonna unpack this, like I said, in a bit, but basically the idea is that the inside of the building block, that's the reason it's glowing, is the insides can change. The insides can like do whatever, but the way that the building blocks fit together doesn't change, and that is, as I will unpack later, a big part of what makes it possible for Ember to have a sustainability story and have a uh, evolution over time story that works as well as it does. And I think it's underappreciated, but it's because of the way we architect and how we think about the concepts. Um, so, I started programming in 2004, and I, Ruby and Rails changed my life. I basically was programming PHP for like about six months or a year before that. Um, learned about Rails, and the reason that Rails changed my life was at that point I was really a beginner, and it was like writing raw SQL inside of PHP was not something that was getting me very far. It's not like I couldn't do it, it was just like taking me a long time to do anything. And the really big deal about Rails for me, and the thing that I really tried to bring to Ember, and I think makes, makes sense, is Rails was not a tool that was like for beginners, and then there was the more expert version of Rails. Um, DHH used to say there's no easy bake ovens. Right, and the idea behind that is there, it's, there should be a way of using the tool that makes sense for beginners, there should be a way of using the tool that makes sense for experts, and there should be a feedback loop between those communities. And so when I started, I was like literally just starting, and Kaz, um, who had been programming for years and like worked 
with JBoss and stuff like that, was using literally the exact same tools as me, and any thoughts that I had about whether the tools were good or not, I could talk to him as a super advanced developer and it made sense. And that idea of like, everybody is basically working with the same concepts is the thing that I took away from Rails. It's the thing that made me able to be a programmer because until then I was like not really sure if that made sense for me. Um, and I think that's something that I believe in and it's what makes Ember matter for me. It's why I'm still here and it's why I think we are still here. Okay. So what are we gonna cover today? Uh, first of all, I wanna talk about Polaris, and so I'm gonna get into a lot of, like not the nitty gritty, because that's what Ed's gonna do, but I'm gonna get into like what programming in Polaris is gonna feel like, and then at the end I'm gonna talk about how does this story fit into um, Ember's story about, that I just told about ourselves and the challenges that we face going forward. Okay, so table contents wise, we're gonna talk about template tag, talk about routing, talk about resources, talk about TypeScript, I'm gonna talk about modern tooling, basically, uh, it's gonna be basically V, stuff like that, share tooling. Um, the, the, the reason I have that bold thing on the bottom there is because it's very easy, it, we're not saying, like, basically, like, Svelte Kit exists today because Sapper existed before, they wanted to adopt V, and they didn't migrate Sapper to V, they instead created a new thing called Svelte Kit. We are not gonna do that, we're gonna take the existing Ember um, tooling and migrate users over to the new system, so basically existing apps will get V eventually subject to the usual migration caveats, um, and that is what I mean by shared tooling, right? We're not making another thing that you migrate to. It's not like, well, there used to be Vue CLI, now there's V. There's gonna be like the Ember tooling, it's just gonna use the ecosystem under the hood. Again, more on that at that point in the talk. Okay, so template tag. So Octane uh, really actually made a big advance here because if you remember before Octane, you had files in app slash components and files in app slash template slash components that were really talking about the same thing. And Octane made a pretty significant ergonomic improvement by, led, by putting the template alongside the JavaScript or TypeScript file. Um, that is nice, but I think it's basically be behind, it's lagging behind our peer frameworks. And that is because all of our peer frameworks either use JSX, which basically means you can put the quote unquote template in the same file, or they use a single file component system which lets you put your template and your style and your, style and your um, JavaScript in the same place. And everybody outside of, like basically most Ember people also, but, every, but the wider ecosystem is pretty convinced that having two separate files is not good and I basically agree with that. And so we need a, we need a solution. I think just FYI, the, the thing that really pushed us here is that we wanted to be able to import stuff into our um, templates and the reason we wanted that is because in order to get all the benefits that I'll talk about later in the tooling space, we really need to not have weird emberisms that are not the same thing as modules. So we really needed a file that's the module, and we really needed that file to be importing things from other files, and that's just how the JavaScript ecosystem works now. Um, and this is basically what we landed on. There's like very, very long series of blog posts you can learn about why we ended up here, but this is what we ended up with. Um, so basically, it the class part looks exactly the same as the Octane class part. There's still track properties, et cetera. Um, and the only difference is that you move the template tag um, from, yeah, so there's tr the track is the same. You move the template tag from the HBS file into a template tag. And I think I, uh, I don't get to it soon enough, but basically if you need it, you import other components into the file just like you would in a normal JavaScript file. And that's like the big difference. Um, but really it's just about taking the two files and putting them in the same place. Um, some benefits that fall out of this that I think are really good, um, you, you can just write a function in the same file if you want a function, right? So like if you're, you don't have to make a whole other file somewhere where you put your quote unquote helper that hopefully is generic enough to justify it, you can just put it in there. Um, and because it's just another module, you can just use a, you could use a named export. I think what we exactly recommend is still gonna be like Ember's gonna have conventions that we encourage people to use and maybe linked, but there's nothing stopping us from using, um, from, from using any normal JavaScript module feature. Like it's just really a JavaScript module and so any, like TypeScript code extraction should just work, right? Like th that's fine. Um, so you just move into another file. Um, also, the function signature is just a normal JavaScript signature. This is the thing that already has landed. By the way, almost everything I'm gonna talk about today has landed, I'll tell you if it hasn't. Um, and I'll talk later about like why, if that's the case, why do we have Polaris? But um, the thing that lets you just use normal functions in a helper file is already a thing that landed and is like pretty, very easy to use in any Ember app regardless of 
how much you adopted um, GGS and GTS files. But, um, but this model where it's just a function and you're using it in the same file, like the programming model where you could just think of your template as having access to JavaScript functions in scope that you can move around, that's of course a GTS thing. And, it, and it's good that you don't have to write helper friends. Um, yeah, so I said that already. Um, so now I'm just gonna repeat, kind of repeat myself. So um, modifiers in Octane go in separate files. And I think one thing I would say about modifiers is that the story before Octane is that components had access to a, a root element, and that meant you had stuff like class name binding, attribute bindings, blast from the past, you don't need to know if you don't know it, but there was a DSL on the component that was like how you talk about just the root element. And Octane basically said there's no more concept of like the components element, there's like that way you could just use the class, class equals, you could use attributes, you could, anything you could do anywhere works. And the way we gave you back the feature of lifecycle was we gave you modifiers, right? We, we made modifiers. And that is technically good, but it basically means that you have the same problem with helpers where you need to like, if you have some DOM logic that's very local to a component, you still need to put it in another file in a different location just to use it, right? And so that's just, I would say, a hole in our migration from I think there was enough benefits to justify it, but if there's a hole, it's a hole in the ergonomics of going from literally it's in the class to it's in a separate modifier concept. And I think what ends up happening is people use Ember render modifiers to glue it together, but those things are not very composable, right? So basically what, so this is an example from the Ember modifier docs, right? This is just how it, like you import it, it's a package, blah, 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 right? It's, I, I, it's a pretty boring example, but it's the one from the docs. And just like with helpers, like the Polaris stories, you can just put the modifier, like it's moved randomly, again, it's from the docs. But like you can put it in the same file, you can access it from the same file and it works. Um, you can just write in the same file and use it directly. And um, you don't need any, like if you don't need any local state, you also don't need a class. Like you can still use a class, but you can just put a template tag in the top level. And I think that's all pretty sweet. Um, Jonas, if you want to come up and wave at people because you missed it before, do it. I told him he could wave, but he wasn't here. Yeah! <laughs> this is... Wave! <laughs> this is human sustainability. <laughs> Thank you, Jonas. Um, yeah, I've been telling him as soon as EmberConf is over, I will have my weekends back, so. So, yeah, so basically modifiers just work. Um, and then I also wanna point out, like, I already said named exports work, but also obviously default exports work, because the point of it is just the value. It doesn't, like, if you already know modules work, there's nothing new to learn here. We will probably have some lints about, like, what the conventional style is, but that, those will be lints, those won't be uh, about how the semantics work, okay. Now this is, I think, the point where we're talking about something that is unique about what Ember is doing here. So people tend to think of JSX as the slam dunk winner of the framework wars, but I think a thing that's interesting, and like go check, you can bet me if you want. Basically everybody else who is not React or a, or a framework trying to be a clone of React does not use JSX, okay? Vue allows you to use JSX, but their documentation is like you probably don't wanna use JSX. Um, go watch talks by either Rich Harris or um, Evan, you about why that happens, but I think basically there are good benefits to using templates, that it is a good idea, and um, basically everyone who is not React thinks that. Um, however, there is a nice thing about JSX, which is that it's very easy to have two, two components in the same file because, because it's just an expression or a function, you can just like make another one in the same file and call it, and that is actually a thing that SFCs lose, right? And that's kind of why Vue ends up having these um, having JSX for like advanced cases is because the SFCs uh, don't give you everything that you need, right? And so the thing that I think is really awesome about the Ember story and is like unique and doesn't exist anywhere else and like makes me, it's like the kind of thing that makes me wanna build something on top of what everyone else is doing and not just like go off and work on Next.js or something is I think this is like a genuinely awesome thing. It basically means that you can have a test that has a template tag that has access to the local scope. You can have a bunch of them in the same file. Um, you can like extract utility um, components that are not ready to be pulled out into separate files yet, and all this stuff just works, and I think if you, if you just quickly look at what I've said, it will be like, oh, template tag, that looks like JSX, but it's actually, it's actually a very nice 
combination of, uh, of the, template, the benefits of templating syntax and the benefits of having expressions that you can put in the same file. So it basically lets you take, it lets you have an SFC that you can like move around. And I think that's pretty nice. Um, the top, I should also say the top level template tag and the one in the component, that's the declaration form. So like that makes it, you don't have to write export default template tag, right? So there's some nice forms for the cases that are like SFCs, but because it's not, because that's just a convenience form, writing um, const toggle equals template tag works also. And I, like, I, again, I think this is like a thing I'm really proud of. I think it's really awesome and it's very unique and like really will shine in tests, I think. I think the fact that you could just like write a template tag gives you a component and you can just like access local scope from the test, I think that's gonna, I think that is like a game changing thing and nobody else really has it. Um, okay. So that's template tag and I think, like I think that's really awesome. Template tag basically already landed. Um, I will say later, when I say landed, it still, you have to configure it and it's pretty annoying, especially using TypeScript, so you ha like have to be motivated. But all the underlying features, the prettier support, um, the support in the Ember language server, um, ESLint for the most part, um, like the implementation that makes it work at all, this, it works in classing and embroider, right? All that stuff already landed if you install Ember template imports. Um, and so I think that's like, we need to finish the job and I'll get into that, but I think, like I think that's an example of something that is well in hand, that we just need to focus on getting polished over the finish line, but we like really already did most of the implementation. Okay, um, the next topic is basically a unification of a lot of concepts that um, called resources, and I'll just quickly go through a bunch of examples that show you what I mean by that. Um, by the way, it is uh, very late, but my clock says 15 minutes, so basically I'm not, I'm not wildly over, it just a lot of things happened earlier. Um, okay, so basically what is resources? I think a way to think about it is that they rationalize class-based helpers, modifiers, services, and even routing, and that doesn't mean like it's like this obscure concept that you need to learn or whatever. It's just, it's gonna basically be the replacement for a lot of those concepts in a way that hopefully you'll see is reasonably ergonomic. So let's just look at like first class-based helpers. So class-based helpers are this weird thing that is kind of like a function, but you need it if you need services or track state or something like that. You have this compute method. Uh, if you need lifecycle, it gives you will destroy. But the way it looks to you as a user is it looks like a function in your, in the HPS file, right? Um, if you look on the right-hand side, the resources side, um, that is like resource, it's, the DSL here, by the way, is the Starbeam DSL, which I'll talk about in a minute, but basically um, there's gonna be a class-based version. It's basically blocking on stage three decorators getting out of the, getting done, but this is like a way of getting, like if you are a fan of the functional modifier or thing or like the helpers, those have limits, you, you run into problems if you need lifecycle or services or whatever, or they look different in different people's add-ons. This is basically a way of pushing as far as, as is reasonable on the, on the function version of things, and then if you have like a lot of track state and a bunch of methods, clearly then you want the class version, right? So anyway, that, it's a DSL. I think without getting into too much detail, it's like a very, it's a small DSL that gives you a way of set, creating setup and teardown logic, and the point is that when you say parentheses current time in your template, it works the same way that it worked before with class-based helpers, and the important thing here is that it gives you cleanup logic, right? So if you just have a regular function, you can't, there's no cleanup, a lot of the time you want to set up some state that also gets cleaned up, and that is what resources are for. Now, if all they did was replace class-based helpers, it's probably like a little, a little much, but there's a bunch of other things that you get out of it. So the first one is that a service in Polaris is just a resource that's scoped to an app, right? So a resource is just a reactive object that is attached to some lifetime, normally a component, but there's also a concept called the app in Ember, weirdly not in a lot of other frameworks. Um, and so sometimes you wanna attach a object, like maybe you have a long-lived channel or something like that, or a web socket, right? Like that's the kind of thing people do with resources. Importantly, like teardown still does exist, and the, re like, the reason for that is that, especially in integration testing, you wanna be able to like keep, you, you don't wanna have to like boot up the whole app every single time you run a test, which is how most other frameworks do it. And so by basically putting the, lo like by having teardown logic inside your services, you can boot up the app, get some app state, um, and then tear that down, run another test with the same code, right? And that actually does make our integration tests rather fast, and like uniquely so in some ways. And 
So basically, that, in that sense, services right now are like another concept from class-based helpers, and the resource concept unifies them. And importantly, if you already had the resource from the previous slide, you don't have to do anything special to make it a service. All you do is you say that you want to use that resource as a service when you use it, and that basically means like only make one of them please for the current app. Um, okay. Um, and by the way, like this is, I spent a lot of time working on this, but like the, when you say, like there's no types anywhere on this slide, but you get the right answer when you say service current time from TypeScript, and I think that's like pretty nice, and I think, I think the wider ecosystem could spend more time trying to get inference to work well, because TypeScript is actually very good at inference, but people are like just very willing to be like, just put some angle brackets here, and that is like fine until it doesn't work and you're confused about why things are failing at runtime. So I, I, I really like leaning on, on inference, and I think this is, I, I, we made it work. Okay, um, modifiers, that's another thing, and this is like, okay, how does Polaris have a story for modifiers that's built in and not like an add-on? Um, basically, it's a resource that's scoped to an element, and uh, I have a bug in this slide, I think, but uh, yeah, it's, basically there should be, the inner function should be a function that takes an element and returns a resource, right, so basically the, the, when you say curly curly element size, it basically calls a function with the arguments, more or less, and then um, when the element gets, like when the element exists, it calls the function that gets returned with the element and gets back a resource, and that resource has a lifetime, that lifetime is attached to the element's lifetime, right? So again, that's like, uh, probably the first time you're hearing it, it sounds like I just said a lot of words, but it's basically just another way that the same resource concept, which is just an API, in, it's the API in Ember for generically saying, I have some reactive state, I want it to be attached to some lifetime. It's a way of reusing that same concept and sometimes the code, um, because the element, it usefully, doesn't ever, in any framework, doesn't actually change at runtime, right? The element, is, the element that you attach to a directive or a modifier, whatever you want to call it, is, is, is a stable thing, and it just gets set up and torn down, so it is, is actually possible to give it an element. It's just like if you're using a framework like React, then you end up with nulls for no reason. Um, but anyway, the point is that it's just a function that takes some arguments, that returns a function that takes an element, and gives you a resource. So I th hopefully the, the moral of the story here is like, resources are a concept that um, has a pretty nice DSL, we'll have a class-based DSL eventually, and like answers a lot of questions about what we're doing, like about what our concepts are. Um, right. I don't know why I have that slot. What is this extra slide here? Whoa. What is happening? Everything is going crazy. Mm, I don't know. Okay, next slide. Uh, so I have import from Starbeam Universal here. Like, what is that? This is the one and only React slide that I'm gonna show here. Basically, Starbeam is like a successor in some, to a big part of what Glimmer does, not the HTML part, but the tracking part. Um, I work on it, and uh, Nullbox, who works on Ember Resources, also is on the core team of Starbeam. And the main thing that's different between Starbeam and Glimmer is that Starbeam is, give, makes these concepts something that works for all frameworks. Um, we have already written a React, a Preact, and a Vue renderer, called the things renderers. Um, the only reason there isn't already an Ember renderer is that Ember already has a version of all these things that already work and works in people's apps, so I haven't felt like I need to prioritize like giving people some churn. Like, the only benefit that you get from Starbeam is other people are using it who are not Ember, so I need to, like, make that actually happen. But the point is that the universal APIs will glue in ergonomically into Ember, as I've been showing on these slides, and the, the point is that you can publish libraries that just use Starbeam Universal that don't mention Ember at all, and then other frameworks can do, like, what I'm showing here on the right, like, other frameworks can do, can say, like, use modifier in the React case, and then, you, like in React, you have to use ref or whatever thing you have to supposed to do or idiomatically in React, but there's a, a version of it, like in Vue will be a directive, that's kind of thing. Um, so that's, that's what it is. It's from, the, if you don't care about any of that, it's just, it's like saying Glimmer component, it's like the thing you imported, but if you do care about it, it gives you a way of writing universal, universally reactive things that work in all frameworks, and go to starbeamjs.com, there's some documentation there, and that's what it is. Okay. Um, Okay, so all that brings us to routing. Now, this, these slides are the most speculative slides because there is no RFC that describes the syntax. However, it is, the constraints are, like everybody who works on routing in Ember has this un, a clear understanding of what the requirements are and I will talk about them and they give you very little wiggle room. But the, of course, everyone in this room and everyone watching is welcome to when we get the RFC to like, I wanna say bike shed, but not in a negative way. Like to get, like I, I, I don't like the word bike shed because it, it implies like it's not a good thing, but I think 
get, making the, like, the concept make sense to everybody, like making that happen requires that people like see that the words are not too weird and like if you just use functional programming words everywhere, that, that's not what happens, right? So feel free to come in, help us refine the syntax, but these slides are basically trying to show you like how the concepts fit together conceptually, but don't take the, the exact syntax for anything specific. Um, okay, so basically what on the left-hand side is like what I think is probably going to end up happening in practice for most cases. Um, I think that should say articles.data.ts. Um, so basically there's going to be some kind of uh, resource function which takes a URL and gives you back a thing that counts as a model data. And I think that's mostly what will happen. But I think the, the right-hand slide, I have as a rule, like things need to fit on a slide, right? The right-hand side, I guess it has a tiny bit of scrolling. Um, the right-hand side uh, is basically showing you it's not that hard to write the resource. It's just that like it would not be great if every single time you wanted to like fetch a URL, you, you have to do it. Now you might be saying like, I think you could have made this slide look less annoying if you just use fetch directly, but like you probably actually do want to support cancellation as a general principle because if the, if it takes a long time to make the fetch and then the user navigates to another page, probably a good idea to cancel the existing one and not just have it keep running. So. I think that's a good idea, and you don't have to take my word for it, like this is like a YouTube, like it's one of the YouTube things that keeps going by, which is like, hey, by the way, you're probably doing it wrong, you really should be using a board controller, okay, that's fine, but we probably should just give you a thing that does that for you, and that's the only reason that this slide looks like it has more things on it, is because I, I think that's probably what we're gonna do. Like the left-hand side, it's not magic, it's pretty easy, but I just don't think everyone should have to write it all the time, okay. Um, now, so far I just showed you like it's just a function that returns a thing, what about dynamic segments, I think that's indeed the tricky thing. Um, by the way, that hash app there is basically, it's just using a Node.js feature called import maps, so like if your package JSON has an import map, F, like TypeScript and everybody knows what it means, and as part of the general feeling that we should probably stick with what everyone else is doing as much as possible uh, to get the benefit of ecosystem tooling, that's probably what we're gonna do. I think we don't have an ROC yet, but I think Import, we generate an import, like your package JSON by when you generate an Ember app has an import map in it that points hash app somewhere, then you say hash app and everything works because of, that's how package JSON works now is probably what's gonna happen. Um, okay, so basically what is a dynamic segment? It's a parameter to a function that returns a resource, so it's kind of like the element thing I showed before, right, it's a function, takes something and returns a resource. Um, and I don't, Ed's talk at Emberfest last year like goes into a lot of detail about philosophically what's going on here and maybe he'll talk about it later, but I, I'm just trying to show you like from a user perspective what's going on here. So there, there's stuff like it's bad that controllers outlive the template. I think that's all good stuff to understand, but it's, I'm not gonna get into it super aggressively here. Um, the top part here is probably the most speculative part of all this, um, and basically the key point about all of this is that in Polaris, and like with embroider, routes are the main unit of where code splitting happens. So today there is no code splitting, so there's not much to say about it, but the main unit of code splitting is a route, and the key point there is that, um, uh, I guess I should say, I'll, I'll say my point and then I'll say that point. The, the main point, when I say the unit of code splitting, what I mean is fetch, and I have slides on this, fetching data and fetching the code should not have to happen together because the, like, it's obvious that fetching the code is gonna take, the component tree for your route is gonna take a while and you don't wanna have to wait for that to happen before you start fetching the data. So basically the structure of this API is designed to make it easy for Ember and you to think about like here's the part that's fetching the data and here's the part that's fetching the code and if you put them all in one file, I think we'll support that maybe as like a very simple thing that you could do, but if you put them in the same file, then they're all sharing the same imports, and that basically ends up meaning that you can't really start running the code to fetch your data until you actually have all the code for your components, and that's just wrong, like that. It's, it's just, it's not like about SSR or anything, it's just like pointlessly expensive to do it like that. Um, I wanna say like a goal for this design, and I think if we can't make this work, but I think we can, then we won't do this, but like the goal here is that if you have an ID parameter inside of the articles function on the other side of that, that this should give you an error if you leave it out or something like that. And if you're curious, there's something called a tag template literal type in TypeScript that together with some other magic that's not out of the realm of what everyone else is doing, um, we can make it work. And again, if it does, I think I would rather if you don't have to write import parens everywhere, but I think if you, 
we'll, we'll do whatever we have to do to make it make sense that this is true. I think this will, something like this will work. Um, okay. So I said this already, a routes component and its code load in parallel. I think critically, um, this is the critical thing. It has nothing to do with SSR, right? Um, it just has to do with the fact that we don't want to have to wait for the parent component to render before the, like you can start getting its data and then like you render the child and then you can get its data. Like that just, if you look at the React story around all this, like how they have to figure it out, eventually they settled, they had like a few options and they eventually settled on a thing that is more or less exactly this, which is like you fetch and render at the same time, like you, you are doing them in parallel. Um, and everything other than that, like you can make suspense and react, do anything you want, but anything other than that is like recommended against because of the fact that it creates the waterfall problem. And I think we should just try to avoid that by default by idiom. Okay, uh, I only have a few more concepts left. So um, I just, this is very quick. I just wanna say, when I say that there's conceptual building blocks, what I showed on the screen is pretty different from the routing story that we have today. But I think it's important to reiterate that the routing story that we have can't change like what is the point of routing in Ember? And part, the point of Ember, routing in Ember is Ember is a web framework. We should have good URL support. What does good URL support mean? Like I'm not gonna, you'll go watch an old talk that we've given, but it means like the back button works, reloading page works, you can open a new tab, I can send a URL to somebody on Discord and then tomorrow it still works, right? All that is good. And there's like a lot of other things. Basically it should work like a static site, right? And more or less, oh, I, Okay, I will, if I have time for questions, I will call on you first. Okay, it's an opinion he has about Ember. Okay, I'm... Okay, if, even if I don't get time, I will ask you later, because beginner's mind is very good. Um, okay. So basically what I mean by things work is like if you were looking at a page and you reloaded it, it still looks the way the user expected it to work, which basically means that meaningful state is preserved. You don't, like, I think you know what the bad version of this is, and I, even though we've been, Ember's been talking about this like since 2012, there's still a lot of sites that do the wrong thing. But I also mean like you can make permalinks with query params, whatever. Like I think this is all, it's all boring, but I, if you go into the whole details, like a lot of frameworks, a lot of routing systems today that even claim to be inspired by Ember don't get all the, details of these things right, and I think the guiding principle is just like, it should work like a static page, more or less, the URLs. URLs are very important, you put them on billboards, you send them in text messages, they should be stable, they should work, they should capture the state correctly, et cetera. Um, okay, so now, uh, why, like, why do we do all the things I just said? Um, I'm just transitioning now into the, like, okay, what are the challenges that Ember faces, et cetera, so I'm gonna play another video and then try to wrap it up and pass it off. If we hadn't started Tilda, if some entity like Tilda didn't exist and instead Ember was a project that Yehuda and Tom and whoever were working out of some other big company, there's a good chance by now that some executive from on up high would have come down and been like, I don't care about this, scrap it. And that would have been the end. But because we have these smaller people-driven companies in our ecosystem, that's not really gonna happen. If we hadn't started Tilda, if some entity like Tilda. It's a loop, on a loop. Um, okay, basically I think this is really true. I think I feel more strongly about it now than I felt when, I, when we originally recorded that. I think at any given point there's gonna be some important companies that are investing a lot in Ember, but Ember is really, really structured so that a disinvestment from any significant company does not actually materially affect Ember's ability to make progress. Of course, less investment, less resourcing has some impact on the, the short and medium term progress, like what people are doing, but I think as an organizational matter, there, no company like owns Ember and no company is, uh, no company's disinvestment. I think a really good example that I use is like, we don't use people's internal bug trackers. We don't, like our roadmap is not approved by some manager somewhere inside of some company. So that means that if somebody like suddenly disinvests, there's no infrastructure or, 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 or org chart matter that like suddenly has to be quickly changed. Like that, people are part of the Ember core teams as, a, as individuals, not as companies. Okay, so why are we still here? Like, in some sense, that's a good question. Like, okay, well, we'll do a lot of things that make us as good as other frameworks, but like, okay, but other frameworks already exist, so why are we still here? And I think the, the really the answer to this question and why I am still here is that the ideas that made Ember good, that make people wanna be in the room here, and that make apps that were built 
literally like 10 years ago still exist today and are able to use like GJS files and TypeScript 5.1, like why is that even possible? That's like so far out of the expectations that anybody in the ecosystem has, like that is still a controversial thing to try to accomplish. What everyone else does is, oh, V came out, let's like fork everything, fork the ecosystem and do something else. The fact that we invest so much energy in building blocks that we work on together, that like beginners and experts can work on together and iterate on, that um, add-ons can, it, like that don't require us to like suddenly fork the ecosystem and be like, okay, there's the part of the ecosystem that supports Octane and whatever, like all of that is like a hugely controversial thing that is a really good and powerful thing about Ember that, make, that means that like older apps still work today, but that also means that if you start an app today, that that app gets the benefits tomorrow and next year and the year after that. And it's just, if you even rewind the tape three years, there's almost no framework that is not Ember that didn't have some kind of big fork that would require you to do a significant effective rewrite of your code base. And I think the fact that Ember has been not doing that since 2012 or 2013 is a good enough reason for us to keep doing this. Um, I, I will talk again about the challenges in a minute, but I think how I usually summarize what I am talking about here is that we, other ecosystems basically, it's normal to have a concept of ejection, which basically means like, well, there's the like create React app or whatever, like the thing that is the nice beginner friendly thing, but like in practice you like press the eject button, it like explodes out into your code base and now that's the public API that you're using. That, doing that basically means that it's very, very, there's no difference between the implementation details that a very advanced user understands and the way, the conceptual building blocks that beginner users are, like intermediates are using. And that just makes it almost impossible to do any kind of significant changes to the code base without forks, right? So basically what no ejection means is that it aligns the mainline APIs, like the APIs that are the primary ones in the docs with the way people actually use them. It also aligns the way people use our APIs with the way people think about the APIs, right? And that basically means that when we say, okay, we're not gonna, ember.object is not a thing anymore, that's fine because the authoring format all along was import from em at ember slash string, and just because there's an implementation detail that that turned into ember.string somewhere internally for the last three or four years, changing that to be a real module doesn't affect the, the mainline API, how you think about the API, or how you use it, right? And I think that's, it's just a thing that Ember does that other people don't do. Um, and I think just when you eject, when you have ejection as like a primary way that you think about things, it leaks the low-level details of how things work into the way the framework is composed and the migration strategy. It's unavoidable, and I think it takes some effort to make that not true, to have a, a difference between the authoring format and the implementation strategy, but it has really paid dividends. It's the reason that, go back three years or six years or nine years, an Ember didn't ever have one of those forks, even though at, at every one of those periods, everyone else was doing it. Okay. Um, I said the word authoring format, basically I just want, I have to define it because no one else does it, but Ember is unique in defining our public API in terms of an authoring format that is separate from the way the framework is built. And that means that thing, like I talked about before, like at ember.string becomes ember.string, that's an internal detail. The authoring format in 2016 and today is you import from ember slash string. And that means that we could change the implementation details from loader.js, which is like very not compatible with the way the ecosystem wants to do things now, we can change it all the way, <clears throat> now I am running out of time, um, we can change it all the way to using something like V, and the thing you, the way you think about it, the way add-ons work, the way you, um, the way you build your own apps, the way you communicate with between different developers, different teams, doesn't change, and I, that's just a unique thing, and I think it's a really good thing, and it's, it's, it's not like we're, sheer force of will is how we keep, like, like people think, oh, well, we, we have a lot of compatibility, so we must be spending a lot of time on it, it's, that's not really quite right. I think when you account for the fact that you have to deal with people on old versions anyway, the, the thinking about things in these terms and thinking about what, like ways to give people tools that are easy to migrate and just making that part and parcel of how we operate has actually given us pretty good velocity. Um, yeah, I have to figure out how to quickly go through. So I just wanna say like this is a thing that is a little speculative but also the add-on already exists. I think basically I think you might, like we don't have a good CSS story right now, frankly, and you might think, oh, that's yet another thing we have to do in Polaris, so like clearly that's gonna be impossible. I think what's nice about the way we're planning on implementing it is that we can have a feature that's like this high level feature, like the scope style tag, and we can use tools like that come out of the Vue ecosystem or the Svelte ecosystem to compile that down into something that is a separate CSS file and then like 
existing ecosystem tools, existing bundlers know what it means to import a CSS file. Like that is already a thing that we don't have to build. So simply doing the transformation from the left side to the right side is enough with existing tools to get what you need. And that also, for the most part, with some work, includes like getting your post CSS configs to be included and stuff like that, right? Because what we're doing is we're leaning on the fact that importing from a CSS file has an actual meaning in the ecosystem. We're not trying to reinvent it, but we're still re keeping the ability to define like what is the authoring format. Because just because you can import from CSS doesn't like that churns a lot in the ecosystem. So we're keeping the authoring format stable, but we're using it's like a much thinner layer now. Um, okay, I'll try to go fast. Uh, I've already said this a bunch of times, so I'm just gonna skip past it, but basically what we mean when we say that we're the together framework is just like there is one thing which is the component, there's one thing which is a service, and it's like over time, across experience levels, across teams, across add-ons, whatever, ecosystem, and that is basically what lets us be a framework that goes together, that migrates together, that builds new features together, et cetera. Um, very, like, go read this thread. Basically, this is a thread where people were like, why do we need the concept of services? And like, me and Tom wrote a lot of words that basically amounted to, it's good to have concepts. Um, it's good to have terminology that helps people understand things. And I think services are an extremely good example of this paying its way in gold. Like, basically, no other framework even has the concept of like a service scope to an app because they don't have a concept of an app. They have context, which you have to blah, 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 right? And this is like, every Ember user knows what this is. It's obvious how to use it, and it's good. Um, it, and it makes testing really good, but you don't have to think about that. Okay. Um, yeah, by the way, app instances are the actual real concept that ends up being true. Like having the thing, there's an app instance that gets, it can be run multiple times, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Um, as an example, very quick, uh, this is a thing that would work in an Ember app today. You can have a Polaris component with GJS, Octane component that uses the new, tra like the new track stuff, the new class stuff, and an Ember component that extend, and like import Ember from Ember. And like that whole combination of things will work. That doesn't mean that you want to do that, but it basically means there's no like sharp dividing lines between things that force everybody to synchronize across changes, right? So that, and that is like a huge one. I, I don't, it's hard to explain. I think Ed actually goes into a lot of detail about why it's good, but I think this is a, a example of what it means that it's good. Um, okay. Yeah, they, I'll skip past this really. Um, I have a quick demonstration here, which I will go quickly through, but I'll, I just want to say why I have it here. Basically, there's a thing called Intro.js. It's compatible with Ember 2.18. If you look at its code, it uses very old concepts. Turns out you can drop it into a component template. It works. Um, I have a little demo of what, like, what I mean by it works. Like, it's this, whatever. It's good. Um, and then, like, you can move that into GJS file. You, you can do imports, but you don't have to switch away from curly syntax. Um, where it's interleaving the old world and the new world there. Um, basically, yeah, I, don't, I don't need to explain why, but basically it just works. Um, you can add tracked state, that also just works. You are still using like the curly syntax, totally fine. Um, you can switch to angle bracket invocation. We actually got pretty far without doing it, totally fine. And like really what all this is about is it's easy to be like, oh, what is the point? Like the answer is when you are forced, when you say like this is the old world and this is the new world and you have to migrate across them, every single change that you make that's any kind of significant at all creates like every, the whole ecosystem has to be like we are moving from the old thing to the new thing every single time and it just forces you to combine a whole bunch of things into one um, feature technically makes add-ons all have to be like am I supporting View 2 or View 3? Like people don't have to say am I supporting Octane? Like you, you have to support Octane but you don't have to say do you support Octane and the old thing? because supporting Octane means you support the old thing by definition, right? And I think there's a lot of, the God, Ed's talk goes into a lot of detail about why, like how we do that, but I think this is like really a fundamental thing that is happening in like under the hood of our design philosophy, but it's like why everything is good. Um, okay, that, here's the challenge and then I'm done. So I think everything I just said is good and I think it's why people are here, like people are in, the, in this room, people are believers, people's apps, like I, I'm, it's not a lie. But there is a problem, which is which we've described as the pit of incoherence, and I think the problem with the pit of incoherence, I have come to believe, is that it actually grates against the actual pitch that makes Ember feel good. So that, base, that is basically like, oh, uh, we should adopt Ember because we can take people from team A and move them to team B. Like, during the period of the pit of incoherence, um, especially right now, that means that like, there's all this tinkering that has to happen that basically makes Ember at the bleeding edge feel like not that different from the other frameworks that you're claiming Ember is better than. And the real kicker is that because Ember is not that competitive with our peers right now, 
you feel like part of the sales pitch that you have to make to your boss or your clients or whatever has to include, and we're using the new stuff, right? So now you're using the new stuff, and that is actually in conflict with the fact that, you, like, that you're, like, you're getting these benefits of going together, right? I think we do need the technical strategy of additions, but we have, there's a problem that is beyond just a normal addition problem that abstractly exists, which is we are just behind now. Like, we, all the benefits are good. They, w they would be unique value propositions of Ember, but it's hard to make the case because of the fact that we're just, frankly, we have competitiveness issues right now. And I think, what is the point of Polaris? The point of Polaris is not just, like, to do one more, like, here they go again. I know people feel like that, but, like, we've been, like, we haven't been, like, saying we're doing this all along. What, what's happening is we've been incrementally getting here, and I think Polaris is the point at which we could say, okay, we, you know, we move to V, we adopt all this stuff, and now um, we've closed the gap with our peer frameworks, and now the part of Ember that is good, which is the working together, like the sustainability story, that is a thing that you could like really sell and not have to be like embarrassed about the fact that there's all these caveats that hopefully don't apply or that force you into a more tinkering kind of mode. And I think critically, and this is, Ed is gonna go into this in detail, we need to do, the Polaris has to involve us doing this in a way that is sustainable going forward, so we're not like saying the same thing three years from now, right? So we need a strategy for closing the gap with the ecosystem that gives us all the benefits of having the separate authoring format and, and like the things that are good about Ember that make us, that make Ember unique and good in a way that does, that is sustainable um, so that when new, the ecosystem does more things, we can like pretty easily adopt the things the ecosystem is doing and you still get all the benefits, right? So I think that is what is needed. Um, so up next, the uh, thrilling conclusion how we're gonna make it happen with Ed Faulkner. Take it away.